Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter 11, and the Apostle Paul continuing to write, and here's what he says. I say then, has God cast away his people? Now let me just stop and clarify what he's talking about. When he says his people, he's talking specifically about Jewish people, as we would refer to them, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By and large, those people in Paul's day had not embraced Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, as being the Messiah that they've been looking for that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And that's still true today. The vast majority of Jewish people have still not recognized that Jesus is their Messiah. I will tell you that that's a growing population in these last days. There are more and more people, and in fact, there are many Jewish believers, as we would call them, who don't want to profess that they're believers because of the backlash and the persecution that they would receive from other Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. But nonetheless, there are even among the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, those that have come to believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So Paul starts off saying, I say then, has God cast away his people? In other words, in fact, this is a great point just to stop and address a false belief that has really spread in the body of Christ that we generally refer to as replacement theology. And it comes from passages uh, like when Jesus told the parable of the landowner that planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. And then after some time, he sent servants and said, go get some of the fruit. And they stoned some of them, beat some of them and such. And finally, he said, uh, I'll send my son. They'll respect my son. And they said, hey, here's the heir, you know, let's kill him. And so they killed the son and such. And then Jesus asked the question, what will the master do to those vine dressers when he comes? And uh, the answer is, well, he's going to really take it to them and he's going to take the vineyard away from them and lease it to other vine dressers. And see, that parable has been taken to mean by some that, well, God gave the Jews the covenant, God gave the Jews the promises, and God brought the Messiah through the Jews. But because they rejected the Messiah, Jesus, therefore he took the Messiah, he took the covenant, he took the promises away from the Jewish people, and he gave them to the Gentiles who would believe. And so God has cast away Israel and the Jewish people, and now he only operates with the church the believers, the Gentile believers in Jesus that have come to faith. Well, so Paul's asking this question. I say then, has God cast away his people? Did God replace his people with the Gentiles who have believed, or we could say the church? That God's not dealing with the Jews anymore. He's not dealing with Israel anymore. He's only dealing with, dealing with the church. That's replacement theology. However, this passage is one of the many passages in the Bible that tell you, absolutely not. God has not just given up on the Jewish people and decided I'm not going to bring my promises to pass for them. No way. God is a faithful God. He's a covenant God. So watch this. I say then, has God cast away his people? Listen to the answer. Certainly not. <laughs> that ought to tell you right there, replacement theology that the church is now the people of God, not the Jews. So even Paul asking this question, I say then, has God cast away his people? See, he's talking about Israel, talking about the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he calls them still his people, God's people. 
And the answer is certainly not. For I also, or excuse me, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now hold on to those words, whom he foreknew. Whom he foreknew. We're talking about the foreknowledge of God, the ability that God has to know the future. So God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now, that provokes my thinking because in Romans chapter 8, here's what the Bible says. Here's what Paul said. He said, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. <laughs> whom he foreknew, he also predestined. We're going to talk here about people who are predestined, people who are the elect by election. But notice here, God brings up foreknowledge. The Holy Spirit through Paul brings up foreknowledge. So it says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. So let me just finish the sentence. Whom he foreknew would be open to the gospel <laughs> if he could just give them some grace and give them some, some help and strength that they are not wanting to reject the true Messiah. So uh, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? In other words, what, how does God answer him? God says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to, to Baal. So Elijah thought, nobody is open to the, the Lord or his truth anymore. And God says, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. They're still wanting to serve me. Verse 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There is a remnant. Now, what's a remnant? A remnant is a part of the whole. It's a part that has been spared. It's a part that has been reserved. It's the reserve stock, so to speak. So what God is saying is, what the Holy Spirit's saying through Paul is, that among all of those who are born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people as we would refer to them, God says, through my foreknowledge, I know who it is who would be open to receive, and uh, they are a remnant that I am preserving, I am reserving, I am setting aside, protecting, so to speak. Watch this. I have reserved, uh, verse 5, even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So you put foreknowledge and election together, and here's what you have. God foreknew that there would be Jewish people who, if he would, by grace, really lean in and extend to them the gospel, they would believe and they would receive. And so what does God do? To keep his covenant, to keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, he's leaning in by his grace. And he has elected those whom he foreknew would receive. You still have to receive. He's not forcing the Messiah, or forcing salvation on anyone. No, but he foreknew, so he is, has elected to provide grace to those whom he foreknew so that they might be saved. Can you see that? Okay, verse 6. And if by grace, in other words, if this is happening by God's grace and not because those people are just, you know, seeking him with all their hearts and calling out to him, no, if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And he goes on to say, but if works, if of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So just a little bit of a, a word twister there. But the bottom line is he's saying this. He's saying, if God really did foreknow who would receive, if he extended grace to them, and therefore he elected them. He chose them to be the remnant. He chose them to be those of Israel who would absolutely be saved and receive the fulfillment of all the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
if God did that by grace, extending that election to them and such, then he said, then it's not by works. They did not just earn it through keeping the law and such. They received it because of grace. And so he says, if it's grace, then it's not works. And if it's works, then it's not grace. You can't purchase a free gift. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And you can't just have freely something that costs money unless somebody turns it into a free gift, of course. So he's saying, look, it's not because they earned it. It's because God, in his foreknowledge, chose to elect them as the remnant and extend grace to them. And so there will be a remnant of Israel that will be saved, and they will be saved by the election of grace based on God's foreknowledge. So see, that is difficult for people to understand, but that's, I believe, exactly what Paul is pointing out there. Okay, so now verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Notice again, Israel at large has not attained or obtained what it seeks. Well, what is it seeking? He said they're seeking to be righteous by earning it, by keeping the law. And they have not obtained righteousness, what they seek. But the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as, just as it was written. So the rest are blinded to the fact that you cannot earn it. Now, the gospel tells them they can't earn it, but for whatever reason, they are just not buying it. They really think you have to keep the law, and because they don't believe, then they continue to do it. So uh, God has, instead of giving them grace, those whom he foreknew would not believe, it says he has given them a spirit of stupor. In other words, that he's given them a spirit to be dumb, to not catch it, to not see it. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Now, let me just pause and say this. Some people would say, that's unfair of God. Well, remember what we read in chapter 9. It says, who are you to say that God is doing something unfair? Does the clay say to the potter, you're not doing right with me? See, so there's a confrontation that you be careful when you start to say God is unfair. God is more than fair. He's gracious. All of us, you know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. All of us deserve to die. So any salvation that happens to us is by the grace of God. So lest anybody cry foul or cry that God is being unfair, we have to put things in perspective. God is being very gracious and benevolent. But notice this. God is not being mean to these people. No. God foreknew that these are the people that even if he leaned in with grace, they would not receive. They would not receive. And so instead of leaning in with these people and making them part of his elect that will be saved and leaning in by grace, he instead gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, he quotes from uh, King David, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. End quote. I say then, Paul goes on, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. Have they stumbled? In other words, did these people just trip, you know, and just, you know, hit a rock and, and trip? And now God's saying, oh, you tripped. You're, I'm just going to sort of push you down and you're going to fall. And he said, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Let's just, let's just give an illustration of that. When Jesus came, you know, just Jesus being here as a human being was good. He healed the sick and he taught about the kingdom of God and such. However, he had to die. Well, how did he die? He died because his own people rejected him. And so when Israel stumbled over him, when they got tripped up, over him being the Messiah, and turned him over to the Romans, calling for him to be crucified. And even when Pilate was wanting to let him go, it was the Jewish chief priests that were stirring up the Jewish mob, saying, crucify him, don't let him go. If you let him go, you're not a friend of Caesar's. 
and they were in essence blackmailing Pilate. We will tell on you that you are against Caesar if you don't crucify this man. And But think about this. What if they didn't crucify Jesus? Well, then salvation would not come to anybody because we needed his innocent blood to pay for our sins. So Paul is putting this in perspective and saying, look, but Israel turning against Jesus and not believing in him has turned out for salvation for the Gentiles. See, and by the way, let me just point out something else. Through the centuries, Christians have inappropriately persecuted the Jews, saying things like this, you killed our Christ. You killed our Christ. As if Jews are the problem because Jews hate Jesus and we Christians, well, we love Jesus. But we have to remember that if they loved him and they wouldn't kill him and crucify him, none of us would be saved. So in the brilliance and the plan of God, those who turned against him and turned him over to death brought salvation to the world. So let me read this part again. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So because the Jews rejected the Messiah, guess what? The gospel of Jesus went out to the rest of the world because the Jews were rejecting it. And so it's become uh, salvation to the Gentiles. Verse 12, now if their riches, excuse me, now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? In other words, if them stumbling and falling, tripping over the gospel of Jesus Christ and the reality of Jesus being their Messiah, if them stumbling over it and rejecting Jesus has turned out for salvation to the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness be? How much better will it be if they accept the Lord? Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. So notice he said, I want to provoke the Jewish people, my own Jewish people to jealousy to serve Jesus. Verse 15. For if their being cast away, talking about the Jews, if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If they rejecting Jesus turned out to be a blessing and salvation and reconciliation of the world to God, how much greater of a blessing will it be when they finally come to themselves and they recognize that the Messiah that so many Gentiles believe in is indeed the Messiah. What a tremendous blessing that's going to be. And it says uh, their acceptance of that, of Jesus, will be life from the dead. It's going to bring life not only to their own souls and hearts and nation, people, but it's going to bring life to so many because now the very covenant people of God through whom the Messiah came, through whom the Bible came, through whom the covenant of Abraham came, those very people are all of a sudden going to embrace the reality of the fulfillment of their covenant through Jesus Christ and just think about what will happen and the outflow of that, the ripple effect that will happen. The Jews, look at all these Jews that have come to the Lord and believe in their own Messiah. And he calls it life from the dead. Verse 16, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. Who was the first fruit? Well, the first, first fruit was Israel, not Gentile believers. No, it started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, talking about Jewish people broken off from their own covenant, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being wild olive tree, in other words, you're not Jewish, you're Gentile, you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. You know, you can take branches from one tree, and if you know how to do it, you can graft them into another tree, and the sap, the life of that tree, begins to feed that branch that's a totally different tree. I don't know how to do that, but uh, obviously 2,000 years ago they knew how to do it. So he's saying if Gentiles 
who were not even part of the descendant of, descendancy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they can, through Jesus, be grafted in, and now they're a part of this covenant and this family, uh, if you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. In other words, this covenant and this blessing, this salvation didn't start with the Gentiles. This blessing started with the Jews. And so don't get so cocky as a Gentile believer and think, ah, oh, we don't need those Jews anymore. No, those Jews are the way God brought salvation to you. See, so Paul is putting this in perspective. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Let's just underscore that. They weren't broken off because God said, you know, I don't like them. Or uh, those are ugly people. These are good looking people. I'm going to take the good looking people. No, nope. they were broken off because of unbelief. They weren't broken off because God just said, you know, I'm just going to elect some of them and the rest, ah, I'm just going to throw them away and they don't even have a chance to be saved. No, nope. no, they were broken off because of unbelief. They had an opportunity to believe, but they chose not to believe. Because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. So Paul said, you who I'm writing to, you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. In other words, if God, when the Jewish people rejected him, did not spare them and say, well, even though you rejected me, I'm going to save you anyway. Then he said, don't expect God to save you as a Gentile who didn't, you were not born into the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God may not spare you either if you start to stumble in disbelief. Verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. Therefore consider, he said, consider both sides, the goodness of God and the severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. Let me just say that again. It says, and they also, the Jews also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. This is why we have to preach the gospel to the Jews as well. Because they need to believe so they can be grafted back in. So, he says, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, uh, which, uh, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do desire, brethren, that you should, uh, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So, notice he said, blindness has in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? Well, there's still lots of Gentiles that need to be saved. And so there's coming an end of what's called the times of the Gentiles. And, uh, and so God is allowing this to happen. And then in the 70 weeks of Daniel, we've already clicked through 69 of the 70 weeks. And of course, weeks there is seven year periods, 69 of the seven year periods. And then since that, when Jesus was crucified, from that point, we've been in the times of the Gentiles. But we're coming to the end of the age where the Jewish stopwatch is going to click on again. And there's one more seven-year period that is going to tick off. And of course, that's the tribulation period. And that is the 70th week of Daniel. Okay, so let's see. Where were we here? 
for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so, verse 26, all Israel will be saved. And so all Israel will be saved. Now, what does that mean? This is one of those challenges theologically. I've heard people preach, and I have too. What does all mean? All means all. And so some people would say, see that? Every Jewish believer, excuse me, every Jewish person is going to be saved. Well, is that true? Because we have prophecies that tell us in the Old Testament that they're not all going to be saved. They're not all going to believe. They're not all going to submit to the truth that the Messiah is indeed the only way of salvation. So when it says all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He's not saying every person that's a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be saved. In fact, in the previous chapter, you remember Paul writes, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And he also says, not all Israel are of Israel. In other words, even among the Jewish people to whom God has made a covenant and through whom he has brought the Messiah and, and the word of God, even among those people, there are many who will not believe. They will not submit themselves to God and such. But do you remember we read here that God, by his foreknowledge, has extended grace and elected certain ones called a remnant. And so all of Israel, Israel will not be a nation that is left out of salvation while all the nations of the world have people a remnant of their own to be saved, that God is going to come back to Israel at the end of the age. He's going to open their eyes to the truth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And the remnant of Israel will open their hearts to the Lord. They'll be saved and God will save them during the tribulation period. You remember the 144,000 that their heads were marked? See, this is all part of this. All Israel will be saved. Not every single person, no. But those whom God foreknew, if he leaned in by grace, would accept. God says, I'm electing them to be the remnant because I don't want to lose everybody from Israel just because they're hard-hearted. I want to save as many as I can. This is all by the grace of God, by the way. So, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. And then the quote, verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Notice, concerning the gospel, they're enemies. What does that mean? Well, in Paul's day and even today, uh, if you go to the land of Israel, people who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Jews, the Orthodox, and that would include those in parliament, want to shut them down. They're enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election... They are beloved for the sake of the fathers concerning those whom God by his foreknowledge has elected to be saved and to receive the fullness of their own covenant, who is Jesus, the Messiah, that, uh, but according to the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What does that mean for the sake of the fathers? God made a covenant with Abraham to bless his descendants. And so by God fulfilling this and saving a remnant of the descendants, it is for the sake of the fathers. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's talking specifically about Israel and the Jewish people. That God, his gifts and his calling upon them is irrevocable. So replacement theology is wrong. God is not revoking his gifts and not revoking his calling upon Israel. For, verse 30, as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also having been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches 
both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In other words, Paul is acknowledging as he's writing, oh man, the mystery of God, God's ways, his insight into how all this works and why it has to work this way, he says is, is unsearchable. It's amazing. For who has known the mind of the Lord who, or who has become his counselor? Obviously, nobody. Or who has first given to him, to God, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul just ends the chapter putting that into perspective. Like, don't try to tell God he's doing right or wrong. God's ways are so thorough, so extensive, and so precise. Just listen to him and let him teach us his ways because his ways are always right. Well, that's chapter 11. It is a challenging passage, but a good one. I'll tell you, I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 12.